Welcome back to another uh, episode of my uh, Deuze vlog. Um, really happy that you're here, that you're joining us uh, for what I hope uh, and what I know is yet again a really inspiring session. Uh, a conversation I have in this video with two dear friends and wonderful colleagues from Sweden. Um, today I'll be talking with Karen Fast and Stina Bengtsson. Uh, Karen is a professor, associate professor in media and communication studies at the Department of Geography, Media and Communication at Karlstad University in Sweden. And she's also an active member there of the interdisciplinary Geomedia Research Group. And she currently holds a position as a researcher in the Department of Media and Communication at the University of Oslo in Norway. Um, and there she works on the DigiTox uh, project, uh, an interdisciplinary project that um, is a collaboration with uh, University of Oslo, University of Bergen and Christiana University looking at um, causes, implications and reactions to uh, our intense digital involvement. And Stina, Stina Bengtsson, is a professor at Media and Communication Studies at Södertörn University, just outside of uh, Stockholm in, in Sweden. And her work on media and everyday life uh, spans for 25 years looking at phenomenological, material, uh, ethical, uh, spatial perspectives on people and their uh, media use. Um, she's currently involved in, in a project, uh, some of the er early publications have already come out, on how young people make sense of the news, a phenomenological perspective on young people and news in collaboration with Swedish, Estonian and Russian scientists. And with Karen and, and, uh, and Stina, I'm having a discussion about, well, inspired uh, of course, about their work, uh, um, uh, Karen's work, for example, on transmedia work, on how, how knowledge workers navigate um, uh, the, the promises and premises and also uh, 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 threats and challenges of media in their lives and their working lives, um, how their work speaks to our current situation, the, 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 the corona context uh, within which all of us live. And Specifically, uh, we're talking about a paper that they recently published together uh, with Andre uh, Janssen and Johan Liddell uh, on media and basic desires, developing an instrument on how to adequately assess what people do with media and what that means to them in a media culture where it becomes harder and harder to effectively reflect on our own media use, to see media, if you will. And, and this paper, for me, really uh, is, is the inspiration for, for a whole new way of, of looking at this and to take responsibility for our role as media scholars in, 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 in this environment. Uh, we are talking about a lot of things in, in this hour or so of conversation together, which I hope you'll find inspiring for your own work and for making sense of this epic, crazy media environment that we all find ourselves in, of which escape doesn't only seem impossible, perhaps not only unlikely, but also perhaps not really all that desirable. Um, and is there a way to find humanity in our technology rather than without it? Um, I hope you enjoy uh, this conversation. Please check out the other videos in this series. There's many more to come, of course. And uh, I hope to see you uh, uh, online at the comments and in other ways uh, very soon. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks again for, 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 for doing this. Um, really cool to see both of you. It's, it's been a while. Um, uh, and of course, both of you are living in a country that the whole world is watching <laughs> in the current uh, uh, um, uh, Corona context. And, and I'm sure we, we're going to get to to talk about that. Um, oh, maybe we can start uh, there. I mean, obviously, I mean, one of the most fascinating, is that the right word, things about the, the pandemic is that from the get-go, from a moment that it was announced by the World Health Organization, it was simultaneously labeled as an infodemic, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and explicitly stating the WHO that, 
the infodemic is just as bad for us as the pandemic. Right? The, the, the way the media cover this and the way we act out in media has similar kind of health consequences as, um, as the virus itself. And it seemed to me that this is one of the first times where there's this, such an explicit acknowledgement of how mediatized our lives have become and how that has very real consequences. Now, now in, 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 in the, uh, a paper that you recently co-authored uh, about media and basic desires, one of the things you talk about in that paper is that people still, to some extent, seem reluctant or uncomfortable to really acknowledge how deep the media rapid hole goes in their own lives, right? They say, yeah, it's important to, to be informed and to be a citizen and to know what's going on in the world. But when it comes to their own private lives and how media play a role there, they're kind of, well, maybe not that important. And, you know, I can, I can still do without. Um, um, and, and you call this perhaps a yet to be mediatized aspect of life. So would you suggest or, or could you argue that in this corona context we've taken that hurdle like we've beginning to acknowledge that wow yeah no media are actually part of everything and not just what you call the civic desire part what do you think about that do you want to start karin or <laughs> <laughs> i can give it a shot Please. Um, it's a really great uh, question and the funny thing is that, as you mentioned, um, I'm currently in this new research project about digital disconnection, where we investigate phenomena like digital detox camps and, and trying to understand this uh, emerging trend of wanting to disconnect or seeking refuge from digital media in various ways or things that are mediated <laughs> by digital media, at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started this project in February this year. It was exactly <laughs> coinciding with the, the whole pandemic. And that of course uh, meant for me, I started the project and the, the project had been running a bit before that, but uh, that meant for me that I got a very special outlook on both the pandemic, but as you say, also uh, mediatization and uh, questions about media dependency and the ways in which we interact with media in our everyday lives. Mm. Because suddenly we couldn't talk about everyday lives in the same sense anymore, but rather in extraordinary situations and especially in lockdown countries, of course. Uh, but also here in Sweden, actually, <laughs> it's been quite dramatically changed the way we lead our lives. Um, and I, it's always fascinating to think about, of course, what this pandemic actually means in terms of mediatization. If things are becoming mediatized that wasn't mediatized to the same extent before. And I think at least uh, if we look at it quantitatively, yes, we do spend more time with screens, obviously, we have uh, Zoom meetings and uh, weddings and uh, even funerals <laughs> speak yeah. about the more intimate parts of life. Um, so that's one thing. But the other thing is the more qualitative aspect. Uh, and what we experience now is a kind of enforced mediatization. It's not mm. something that we perhaps would have chosen if we were to lead our lives as we are used to. So the question is whether or not we will stick to our new habits once we are allowed to choose again <laughs> how right. to engage with media, because right now we really have no choice uh, to the same extent, at least, that we used to. I can, I can also add that you're absolutely correct that, that we have, I mean, started sort of worldwide to problematize the media in, in during this pandemic and people are so aware of, of uh, sort of the infodemic and the, the false news and all that and um, and but I'm, I'm not actually sure and, and and it's also obviously a fact that that we have perhaps I mean started to do even more things sort of online or using digital media during the pandemic compared to what we did before uh, even though we did also a lot of things before the pandemic I'm, I'm I'm not really sure if, if people are um, 
so aware of that sort of anyhow or, or of course we are I mean we have uh, after works online I mean that's perhaps a new thing most people don't but now we certainly I mean suddenly we do that so so some things but but I mean coming back to our article and the way that we sort of problematize the different dimensions of, of mediatization and and where our um, empirical materials sort of show that that we that people as you say, they don't really sort of acknowledge or they don't say that, that they don't experience that their uh, intimate lives are as mediatized as sort of their more civic lives, for example. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's it, that it isn't. I mean, mm -hmm. things have changed during the pandemic, but still uh, we, I mean, the media have been really sort of um, um, interlinked with I mean, so many things we do in everyday life for, for quite some time. And, and it is also quite uh, interesting in our uh, results that we present in this article. One interesting thing is that the younger um, um, people that we sort of the younger uh, part of the population, they are sort of less aware or, or sort of they don't really say to the same extent that than they compared with the older ones that that their lives are mediatized and that that may also be uh, sort of related to the, the the kind of media that they use if you mm. for example if you use newspapers and you read newspapers on papers you're very aware that you do this but if you sort of use your phone for for basically everything it's much more difficult to actually understand so so sort of going online or letting the media be part of more and more parts of your life doesn't necessarily mean that that you will actually experience it uh, to the same extent. So I think that's a that's a problem that we may have, in fact, sort of as researchers also, how can we actually capture this? So. Yeah, I can really appreciate. I mean, and th that, of course, is also great about the study that you did is the, the combination of methods and the way you framed a media use study eh, rather than asking for how many hours do people spend with media and those are fairly traditional measures you deliberately chose to ask questions about what people want out of life and what role media play in this all right you, you you call this the relationship between media and basic desires and 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 i, I think that's a truly um, inspired uh, um, uh, move. Um, in what brought you to specifically focus on these desires? So we, we were sort of discussing different things. We were on the one hand discussing uh, mediatization and the discussion about mediatization and we felt a little bit uncomfortable or, or um, unsatisfied with the discussion because all four of us, we have uh, written this article together also, we perhaps we should mention with Andrea Jansson and Johan Lindell, so we're four mm -hmm. authors and we had this discussion about, and, and all of us are um, more or less, I mean some more, some less, but all of us are qualitative researchers, so we're very sort of um, fond of using quality methods and sort of looking at the world through the eyes of our respondents, etc. Uh, and on the and there are of course I mean a lot of qualitative research uh, that looks at mediatization in, in various areas etc. But we had this idea that if you want to discuss mediatization, which I th also think can be quite a problematic concept, but if you want to talk about mediatization, then it's necessary. We we said we concluded to to in fact have like a time. Uh, a timeline, you have to look at change, that's sort of the, the basic idea behind mediatization. Uh, and how can that sort of um, actually uh, be done? I mean, how can we uh, look at, from, from, the, um, from the audience point of view at experiences of living with media over time? And, we, and, and then we also had this idea that it's also problematic that when we talk about mediatization, that is such a, a broad concept and people just say mediatization. We also have this idea that it's quite likely that uh, societies can be structured or mediatization can be structured differently in society, societies along lines of class, gender, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that was also one, one thing that sort of um, brought us into this idea of, of uh, conducting a, a larger quantitative study which this uh, study actually is. Um, so that is uh, um, 
that is one, one kind of background to it. And then, so we had this idea that we want to construct a tool that can actually measure media, people's experience of mediatization over time. Mm. Uh, and then, so, and, and then we started to, to discuss, so going from that uh, discussion, we also went into the idea about deep mediatization. Mm. Mediatization is going deeper and deeper into the human sort of, into what it means to be human. Uh, and then we started to discuss, but what is that? I mean, what is being human? And if you also want to conduct a study over time, it has to be very basic so that you can't really ask questions about specific media technologies or perhaps even about, uh, about specific practices because they may be so different in 10 or 20 years. So we really try to nail sort of down the basically human, uh, so to speak, uh, which is, of course, which was really the fun part also of this, because what is that? I mean, how, how can you measure it? Um, so, so what we did, as we also, as you mentioned, as we also sort of discussed in the article, is that we, we started to discuss what is the basically human. And you can, of course, go to philosophy, uh, to different dimensions of human life, different passions and uh, uh, Etc. But that didn't, we weren't really satisfied with that sort of for our sort of empirical survey study. So, and then we started to discuss. But okay, is it um, Abraham Maslow? Is that the basically human? I mean, hmm, but it's also quite problematic, of course. But and but then we started to to sort of look for uh, research that had uh, tried to sort of nail down the basic dimensions of human life. And then we sort of ended up in this uh, social psychological uh, strand of research. And, um, and we found researchers who had looked for motivation uh, in what motivates people to actually uh, go forward in life. Mm. Uh, and we found this one researcher who, who had empirically uh, developed a, a couple of um, dimensions that he called basic desires, which is, of course, I mean, this is what people long for. This is what motivates us to, uh, yeah, to, to move forward, to live, basically. And they can, of course, be different in different cultural contexts, but that is sort of, that is a way of sort of framing human life. Uh, so we decided we could, perhaps we could take these dimensions and, and, and ask people about the role of the media in them. So that's how we ended up in this uh, a little bit, as you say, <laughs> I mean, yeah, crazy way of <laughs> doing it. Um, um, Karen, maybe I can ask you as a, a follow-up question about this. Um, so what is really great, and in, in the paper you mentioned this as well, is that, that you're not just concerned with you know how people live their lives and they use media in the context and okay that's it no you, you you're very aware or, or or you very deliberately say well but what is a good life in this context right like like to, to ask more than just um um the bit and to me that's where the concept of desire also really like what gets you up in the morning what what makes you do certain things that you otherwise perhaps wouldn't uh, remember um a quote about uh, the relationship between humans and technology in the context of desire. And I wonder if, if you mind sort of I put the quote to you to see if you want to just uh, respond to it uh, with reference to your work or just to what, what it makes you think about. Because it, to me, it speaks so much to uh, uh, the position that you've taken in your work. Um, this is a quote from um, uh, Umberto Maturana, who is a uh, or, or really a Chilean biologist. He writes in an essay about the relationship between humans and technology, uh, the following. He says, I think that the question that we human beings must face is that of what we want to happen to us, not a question of knowledge or progress. The question that we must face is not about the relation of biology with technology or about the relation between knowledge and reality. Ultimate question that we must face at this moment of our history is about our desires and about whether we want or not to be responsible of our desires. Great. First of all, we should have inserted that quote in our article that was really spot on. <laughs> um, but let me begin in the concept of responsibility, perhaps, because that's something that I am also trying to 
think about right now in relation to connectivity and disconnectivity. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, what we can tell from our ongoing research um, in the disconnection project is also that there's a lot of responsibilities placed on us as individual media consumers or users. Mm. We are uh, expected to take responsibility for our own good life or digital well-being, <laughs> which is a popular phrase uh, these days also. Um, and it's perhaps also increasingly difficult to do so. Um, and um, it's, um, it's a problematic, I, I mean, of course, uh, you could always discuss the degree to which we are, we are <laughs> responsible and in charge of our own lives. Um, but you also need to place that in a context of responsabilization that is currently ongoing. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not sure if I uh, get to any answer to your question, but uh, it certainly is an intriguing one to think around. Um, perhaps, uh, Stina, if you want to fill in and then <laughs> I will think meanwhile. Please. Yes, Stefan, I can fill in. If you do you by uh, sort of, uh, if, if by asking, do we take responsibility for how we want our lives to be, then you mean sort of ordinary people or those of us, sort of all of us, or? Yeah, <laughs> good question, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's so that quote made me think of, makes me, made me think that of, um, you know, all these surveys that show that, for example, among young people, that show that the younger generations one thing that they have in common around the world is that they genuinely like the number one issue they all care about is the environment right that, that, that's consistently i mean the reason why you know not just greta thunberg but but kids from 82 countries a year and a half ago went marching is because of the climate change right and and that the adults should do something about this and include the kids in in their deliberation so that's clearly something we want from the world so the we in that sense is is young people these are also the people that are most uh, in media, if you will, right? That, 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 are, that have grown up with media that are truly intuitive, they're haptic, they're voice and motion activated, they're, they're truly integrated in, in their humanity, if you will. So to get them to take responsibility, okay, if you want climate change, then then and 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 you you use media to the extent that you do like um i don't know what would, would responsibility that mean that you don't take a subscription out to netflix because streaming is so incredibly harmful to the environment <laughs> i mean to keep all those servers running and and at full steam non-stop is just incredibly destructive so that could be one way mm -hmm. or you could say well no um i don't know if you've seen it uh billy eilish at uh, the pop star uh, released this campaign uh, a couple of weeks ago with Deutsche Telekom suggesting that what young people should be doing is to use their media to show the world what they really truly care about, to not just tell stories about how cool they look and their duck face selfie or whatever, but to show, you know, that we are uh, politically engaged and the we here is young people again. So, so those are just two very simple examples of, you know, what I could imagine taking responsibility could be, but especially for you, Stine, I mean, because so much of your work makes this connection between media use and ethics and an ethical dimension of thinking about media use. I mean, I, I wonder how you would sort of uh, apply that to, to this, uh, this context. Mm. Exactly, because um, as you as you mentioned, I have really sort of worked on this issue for for many years. So it's right. uh, so one of my biggest interests, really, how people negotiate uh, their own media use and the role of the media in their lives in relation to sort of a good life. And a good life, of course, means both themselves as individuals. So I want to construct my own life like this, and I have my strategies, and I have my um, sort of I, I construct rules for, for what to do, where and when and how, etc. But also, of course, in relation to others, uh, that can be also in relation to my cl closest circle, my family or my friends or 
etc. But also in relation, of course, to the wider uh, circle uh, and more and more to to the world. And I'm, uh, as I uh, told you when we sort of emailed, I'm I'm currently working on. I mean, a project where we actually um, explore young people's the way young people use uh, particularly digital media. Or they only use digital media, so the way they use media to uh, to keep updated or connected to the world, uh, both in their practices, but also sort of more widely or in relation to meaning or to what's important for them. And and as you say, it's it's so striking uh, to to us in this project that. That young people are, uh, on the one hand, very, very engaged, uh, actually, and they really sort of use the media uh, to to learn more about particular issues like the environment, or it can be feminism, or or um, other stuff, uh, and that they sort of connect with people sort of all over the world, many of them, and so even though they they perhaps don't sort of use uh, traditional news media for example they are very very much engaged and 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 actually do much of, of what you say i think so they they and we yeah so they're very sort of engaged and take responsibility and use the media and also say that i want to use the media to, to accomplish this and that so that is one aspect of it but i wouldn't really say that even though people then can problematize sort of digital media in relation to surveillance or um, or to uh, um, perhaps uh, waste, uh, etc., it it really isn't much about the the dimension that you mentioned. Sort of, I shouldn't stream that much. I should put. I mean, I should put my mobile phone away, for example, because I don't we want to be too dependent on it, but not because of environmental uh, reasons. So I, I think there. We have, uh, I think we have a sort of um, a responsibility as researchers there, there to actually talk much more about that. Uh, mm. And that I think also that that's been quite, at least in, in Sweden, I think many people have discussed sort of the digitization, online teaching, blah, 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 online meetings. It's so good for the environment. But I mean, no, it's not. <laughs> so uh, so I, I think we have really a responsibility there as researchers to point at that environmental dimension of media use. Yeah. Mm. If I can Garden, just you... also add that, <laughs> I think that if uh, there is one red thread <laughs> sort of throughout much of my research, mm -hmm. it's that I oftentimes like also to place the responsibility not on uh, users or consumers, but rather uh, to see how our own responsibilities as individuals are always structured by certain uh, commercial interests, not least also uh, cultural and social norms of how we are supposed to use media and where we are supposed to use media in certain ways, like in a work context, for example, where I have done most of my research, we all I think the three of us also agree that we should not check emails perhaps as much as we do because we know that that's not a way to create a good life to constantly be available and mm -hmm. constantly be on but it's not so easy to just leave <laughs> the me email app alone uh, yeah. we end up there anyway and and then I would like to the so-called connectivity imperative which is very present in our flexibilized post Fordist working lives, not least. So <laughs> we we have some responsibility, but it's quite strongly determined also by other factors that are out of our control, that are more cultural and economic and political even. So what I want to ask you is like how, how do we solve this problem as media scholars? Because I mean, I was having a discussion with my students about this yesterday, but how can we actually still study media, right? Because media have, have, have to some extent disappeared almost, uh, and 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 we came up with three strategies. But 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 I know you've you've written about these things before, so I would love to hear from you. Like, what what? How do you solve these kind of issues? I mean, one strategy is that you know you can so, you can study media when they break down. Like that's the moment you have to jump on them, right? Because then all of a sudden we become aware 
And of course, media break down all the friggin' time, right? I mean, connectivity doesn't work. We have to install five new upgrades. And that's a, sort of a moment where the, bu the bubble bursts for a while. And then you can sort of immediately do research. Um, and another way is something that uh, my colleague Tamara Witzke and I, uh, and especially Tamara, has published a lot about is to cultivate a sense of wonder and awe and surprise in the way we look at our objects of study to sort of rather than sort of neatly documenting what's going on just take a step back and say like huh why, why why do i find this interesting what's actually happening here that's funny that's interesting let's right it's sort of a, um, um, an almost like artificial way of set, putting yourself a step re removed even though we can argue that that's impossible given our media environment, but by cultivating the sense of wonder, I think Tamara has, has a really lovely point there. Now, it seems that your solution for now is to, to come up with a very um, intricate um, methodological intervention, right? In, in, in a certain way of asking research questions, a certain way of constructing an empirical model around this, um, uh, like our friends in the social sciences coming up with really complicated multivariate kind of kind of approaches. You do this on a qualitative side or you combine these kind of approaches. I mean, is that the way forward to become more sophisticated methodologically? Or is there also a, a, um, a, a more philosophical take uh, on this? So like for example, uh, phenomenology, which is uh, Stina, especially for you, but for both of you like this, this important uh, um, area of research. Like, how do we solve this problem? Yes, maybe, maybe I can start then. <laughs> exactly. I mean, um, using a phenomenological perspective is basically, I, I think, what you described when you say that you step back and, and construct a kind of wonder to the world. I mean, that is mm. basically what we also try to do in our work, sort of not taking things for granted, trying to be very open in relation to respondents, um, et cetera. So that sort of being really, yeah, exactly creating this kind of wonder to what's, what's actually happening. And, and I think for me, that has always been a really good way of working. I think it gives a lot to actually try to, to be sort of super openly curious about what people actually do and why, and sort of going into, into much of, very much of detail in how people use but also experience and think about the media in their everyday life so I think that is actually quite a good way of doing it sort of not taking things for granted but mm. and I also think that because I mean we have sort of touched upon this uh, really um, large problem that we we all have as media researchers interested in audiences that I mean that you pointed at already in the media life book uh, that the media are in fact disappearing from us. We don't really see them anymore. So it's, I mean, how do we capture something that we don't see? And, and some people have obviously pointed to sort of digital methods. There are methods to look into technology to understand things that people perhaps are not aware of. Right. Um, and that can, of course, I mean, I think that can be a good complement in a way to, to use many different kinds of, of methods uh, actually, but but it is, I mean, on the other hand, it's really not the same to look at someone's phone and say, okay, I know what you did, because that might not be the most interesting as Karin, as you also pointed out, we're interested in how people culturally relate to the media and what it means to them. And then, I mean, looking at someone's phone, it, I mean, it doesn't give us that, but, but one thing that I have also done is, is, for example, to let people look at their own phones sort of let them use digital methods to understand their own way of relating to the media. And that, that sort of creates their, wow, wow, a kind of sort of wandering in, sort of in, in relation to their own media use. So that, that can also be a way of sort of letting people explore themselves in a way um, by using digital technologies, but also talking to them obviously about uh, yeah, how they feel and make meaning. Mm -hmm. hmm. I haven't used specifically that method, but I can see that it's a way forward. Mm. And so in general, I think that we oftentimes joke, me and my colleagues, that we are not really interested in media per se. <laughs> <laughs> 
years. Right. <laughs> Many of us are interested in, as Stina again, the cultural um, context and social phenomena and people and human desires or, yeah, good life. Uh, that's what's interesting. And I think also if we want to get at the role of media in aspects of life, we must start asking questions about life. And then perhaps in, for example, an interview, media will surface somehow. Mm. And then we can ask questions more specifically also about that. But it's very, it's extremely difficult to, to get people to talk about their media habits or how they think about their smartphones. Uh, I've experienced that myself also. So I think that oftentimes you do need to make a detour <laughs> talking right. about something else and then see if media uh, surfaces. But, but how, how, Karen and Estina, I mean, how are we going to, because it, it, for me, it's so funny because in a way, and this has been a bit of a trend in our field, right? Where we decenter the media, where we, I mean, I, I, I sometimes find it difficult to explain to new media studies students, yeah, yeah, you've chosen to study media, but we're actually going to decenter the media now. We're, gonna, <laughs> we're, we're like, we're just looking to the side of media to see what people are actually doing. And they go, huh? But, um, but as we are doing that, as media scholars, the scholars from all the other disciplines around us do the exact opposite. Like psychologists are doing media stuff, sociologists, anthropologists, economists. I mean, even physicists are now into media stuff. Um, and, 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 and of course, they all look at the shiny toys. And, and they are concerned about screen time and, and like, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, what's really happening? <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be a weird situation uh, developing here. Like, uh, <laughs> what is our role in all of this? <laughs> How do you see this trend uh, developing from where you are sitting? Yeah, um, I think that's a super interesting um, discussion, of course. And I mean, we've all sort of been part of this decentered media studies, etc., non-media centric media studies, and so on. I'm actually. I'm actually quite interested in the media. <laughs> we still manage to collaborate. <laughs> Perfect couple. And that is, I guess that is also why I think the concept of mediatization may be a little bit strange, because I actually think that that covers basically uh, most of what we do, sort of yeah. our interest in media and communication studies, namely the role media plays in culture and society. And, and it, it doesn't mean, of course, that we're only interested in the media uh, as technologies. I mean, other people are, but we are interested in how the media come into become meaningful, uh, play a role in in culture and societal processes. So, so for, for me, I wouldn't actually say that I'm, I'm not really. I'm. I mean. I'm the kind of researcher. So when people read my work, they say, oh, you should, perhaps you should look into this um, non-media centric. And I'm like, mm. yes, I have mentioned it a few times and I, I do understand what they say. I, I, I am kind of a non-media centric media researcher, but I, I actually, no, I consider myself a media researcher. And, I, and to answer your question, Mark, I also think that media and communication studies has a lot actually to 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 tell uh, the world and i think that we are much more we're much better no we're not much better but i think that we as you say we know a lot about um how media become has played a role is meaningful in different societal processes and and in some other fields i mean not all of course but people can have a bit of a naive uh, understanding of media and and what it means and what role it plays etc so uh, so i actually i think that we can we still have a role to play actually even though yeah. everyone else is also interested in the media so right uh, um I, I want to talk a little bit about control um because I mean, uh, Karen, your, your, your book that just came out on transmedia work uh, uh, with Andre and, 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 and Stina, your work that we talked earlier about, that, uh, about ethics and morality in relation to media use, um, to me, point towards a perhaps shared concern, uh, maybe I'm stretching a bit, but still, um, that, that about the way people use media, that there's very much um, a tension between, on the one hand, 
people using media in specific ways to get some control over their lives, over their humanity, over what they are doing or what they're supposed to be doing, whether that's at work or at home or simply in their relationship with a, a technological environment or over time and space. Uh, as you also uh, uh, very clearly uh, state, uh, Karen, in your work uh, with the GeoMedia uh, uh, group. Um, but on the other hand, and we've touched upon this before, that, that media are, are increasingly designed. And, and, and you could argue that if you look at the evolution of media design, is to make them um, easier and more intuitive to use and to implement and to insert into your life, right? That, 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 that uh, the less aware you are of your media use, the better it is. That's, that seems to be the, the, the sort of the rule of law that governs the design of media, um, whether that is uh, the, the, the holy grail of ubiquitous computing as it was formulated in the 1980s or the, the design uh, interventions uh, of Apple and Steve Jobs, uh, making media more and more sort of, uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, like invisible and easy to use and, and intuitive. And so there seems to be this tug of war over control. Who gets to control what? Are we get to use media to have more control over our lives or are we exactly by doing so, losing some of the control over our lives? How do you see this sort of tug of war uh, over control? Who actually is control or how can we be or stay in control? <laughs> Karen, yeah. you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a really interesting question. And I think that's a question that most of us in the humanities and social sciences overall is trying to figure out. And it certainly is one of the key questions in my work that I right tend to return to um, and I think if we if we stick to the mediatization concept again I think we need to recognize that it has a double face it's uh, both to some extent liberating and empowering to spend our lives with media uh, they liberate us from space and time and uh, for example as knowledge workers we can work from a distance and and for us much of the promises of the tech industry really holds true it's we are privileged and uh, we can work wherever whenever to a high degree mm. um, but then on the other hand i think that we are constantly also bombarded as consumers with messages about the empowering and liberating potentials of technology uh, and I think it's partly our job also as scholars to um, troubleshoot those kinds of discourses and also to provide uh, contra perspectives and contra discourse that also problematize like you said addictive technologies for example but also other kinds of um, nudging <laughs> that uh, different uh, both politicians and uh, uh, companies uh, engage in to make us use again media in certain ways in certain places and and things like that. So um, uh, again, as you as you can figure, I, I have an anthology <laughs> that that sort of uh, is a bit more uh, dystopian, perhaps. I think mm -hmm. that we are uh, to high extents at least pretty much controlled not only by media, not only by technology, but the whole social commercial context that the media are in, sort of. So uh, I think there is a limit to our agency and that's not to deny that we have no agency at all, but it's restricted, I would say. And, and again, it's our job as researchers also to point out to what extent our agency or our control is restricted because the industry does all the other stuff and tells us how excellent everything is so. <laughs> so, so if I'm if I may quickly follow up uh, and then I'm going to go to Stina but but um, so 
I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the worldwide success of this documentary on Netflix, The Social Dilemma, where former employees of Twitter and Google and Facebook say, yeah, we started out making this beautiful thing, but oh, it didn't turn out the way we were, it was supposed to. And now it's manipulating you and it's controlling you and you're just, you know, a, a little puppet that's being played by Silicon Valley. Um, now, there's been a lot of debate about the merits of the documentary. I believe that aside for now but i wonder does a documentary like that and its popularity and the fact that so many people are talking about it help us to regain some agency like people saying oh i'm gonna delete my facebook now because i saw the social dilemma um or does it actually further in the industry rhetoric of indispensability and all-powerful determination because I've been wondering about that. Is it? I mean, uh, f I wonder if Foucault would have said, "Well, this is just <laughs> more evidence to the power of of the uh, the media system," even though it's framed as opening our eyes. W what do you think, Karen? I would again say also that we need to be wary of uh, the promises of disconnection. <laughs> mm digital detox, then it's it's not that easy to say that as right. soon as we log off, we are liberated and free because then there comes other pro um, problems. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it's not so easy uh, to just disconnect or be critical towards media and not use them. I don't think that's the way to go. I think rather we need to learn how to live with the media and also put pressure on the tech industries and the media industries to to produce ethically <laughs> again, right? Yeah. Um, because um, also, if to we should also remember that uh, this whole uh, disconnectivity imperative is also driven by, as you say, also commercial interests, and uh, um, there are a hand, I mean, loads of loads of self-help books and digital detox camps and different uh, time management apps that we're supposed to use and various techniques for disconnection that also is on the market. And, and someone has a stake in selling these kinds of commodities as well. So uh, we have on the one hand, a very strong connectivity imperative, but there is also a growing <laughs> disconnectivity imperative that are currently competing for our attention and trying to frame how we should relate to digital media and I think mm. they are quite problematic in different ways. Yeah. S Stine, your, your take on this tug mm. of war, this, this struggle for control? Exactly, yeah. Well, I was actually thinking about, I mean, taking it from, from an audience point of view, it's, it's obvious that people have I, I would almost say always, or for a very long time at least, uh, felt controlled by the media. So that is actually not really something that is new. I mean, if you go back to old TV discourses, for example, uh, I mean, way back, but in the 80s and 90s, etc., people um, also felt sort of controlled by the media. And we've had this societal de debates about uh, content, new media content, and how it sort of seduces audiences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so the idea about media control is is obviously very old, mm. and people have also always had these kind of strategies to to manage media control in different ways. Uh, so, having said that, I'm also a little bit ambivalent to this, but but I also I, I actually do think that I am. Uh, I, I actually do think that that the media today, sort of datafied media, of course, do have control in a different way and perhaps a little bit more, or I mean, perhaps a more pervasive way. I mean, e even though you can, uh, even though you, for example, you, you don't use your phone, it still registers where you are, et cetera, et cetera. So, we, I mean, we have all that surveillance uh, stuff. Uh, which we didn't have before in the same way. So, so in that sense, I, uh, I think that, um, yes, that we have to, that we, on the one hand, this is old news. On the other hand, it's uh, new news, <laughs> sort of about uh, media control. So, and I, I guess I, I, uh, I, I haven't really sort of studied sort of the commercial 
um, disconnection in the way that you do, Karin. But uh, you're of course right that this is also part of of the of the industry of the media industry. First, we give people phones, and then we sell them courses and how to handle it. So, I mean, I, I do think also that we have to be uh, uh, really aware of all this and uh, and try not to. Uh, play the media industry, sort of play their game, basically. I mean, I, I, I remember that originally, um, I, I, um, like I, I did an interview with, with the late Zygmunt Bauman some, some time ago, uh, and, and he was grumbling about how the problem of all this new media is that they have disconnection on demand built into them, right? That, that it's without consequence to just disengage. Uh, if you are in a heated debate with somebody and you don't like it, you can just simply log off and it has no consequences. And that inserts an element of superficiality into human relationships that he felt was profoundly um, uh, handicapping uh, our ability to form meaningful connections and communities. It seems, though, that the way you're talking about media now is that that while acknowledging, first of all, that disconnection isn't that easy at all, right? Uh, um, and, and it is certainly not without consequence, uh, either directly or indirectly, either immediately or later on. So that's one thing. But a more deliberate sort of back and forth between engaging and disengaging, connecting and disengaging, can, well, while not completely running away from media, might actually assist in us recapturing, if you will, uh, our fundamental humanity. Now, maybe I'm exaggerating that statement, but I wonder, uh, I would love to hear from you how you feel about that. Like, can we find our humanity in media while at the same time being very wary and critical about how media, uh, to some extent, uh, um, determine uh, um, um, our interactions with the environment? Uh, yes, I think we can, and I actually think that we do. Uh, mm -hmm. And as we have talked about, it's not without its problems, but uh, still, that is what we do. And I think that, sort of relating to the the quote from Bauman that you mentioned, I think that what he actually meant, or his standpoint, must have been that that the media or the internet is something else. This is where life goes on, and then we can go on, or sort of go go there, and that is something different. And I right. think that's not, perhaps not then, but certainly not now. For many people, definitely not the case. The media is the world, yeah. uh, as yeah. you say, and it also means that I mean, sort of going very specifically into his concerns about sort of just leaving sort of a um, a social situation when when it's when we want to i mean that's that's obviously problematic if possible but i i i don't actually think that we or most people today don't think of sort of the internet as something different from their own life i mean it is where life goes on and also that we organize our lives sort of online uh, that is where our lives are organized basically to to quite a large ex extent uh, which means that it's not without its uh, social consequences. Most people don't hang out with the, uh, I mean, unknown people online. Most people hang out with the people that they know and if they would just disconnect, that would have consequences. So I think he sort of, at least from my point of view, I, I don't, I can't really make that clear distinction between the media and life. So that means that uh, uh, I, don't think that's yeah. I, I think that life is media, and media is, is uh, life. So it's uh, it's not really um, a fruitful way of thinking of it. Right. Yeah. Karen. Um, yeah, I can just also say, with the risk of moving away a bit from Bauman, perhaps, but Please speak do. about the consequences of logging off or or disconnecting. I think that we also need to again put that in a context of who we are <laughs> uh, and um, it will have different consequences for different people, obviously. And uh, if I, for example, was to go on a <laughs> digital detox retreat or uh, switch off my phone for a couple of days, the worst thing that could happen is that I miss perhaps some emails. Uh, I will have to catch up with my kids uh, a bit more afterwards. Uh, I will 
probably experience some FOMO or fear of missing out on things. But if I were, for example, in the public health se sector and uh, worked uh, on on-demand <laughs> Uh, part-time or if I was a gig worker for example then uh, switching off would mean that I potentially lose my income uh, for a couple of days or so so I don't think that's what uh, Sigmund Bauman referred to when he was talking about the consequences of logging off but that's certainly other types of consequences and that we also need to think of and again to sort of counter the discourse from also this industry that tries to benefit on, on disconnection, not only connection. Um, yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, work that um, uh, Mirka Madianu and Daniel Miller have done on, on uh, the media use, for example, of um, migrant workers in, in the UK. So a lot of them, uh, like uh, maids of that, came from the Philippines yeah. and <clears throat> for them mm. they, they call the mobile phones and internet connections uh, for these people they call them technologies of love mm. because that's their only lifeline to their mm. families to their kids and their grandchildren so switching digital de detoxing for them is a nightmare right it's it's like uh, yeah and it, it, it that actually undercuts their humanity so mm. that really speaks to to your concern here I, I mm. guess and also, again, talking about responsibility, we could also talk about irresponsibility if we decide to just log off. That oftentimes that means that someone else would have to step in to do the job that we were supposed to do as parents or as colleagues, for example. If we just disappear, right. whether it's from uh, Facebook or if it's uh, from the email or from the phone uh, overall, that means someone else would have to... Uh, do things for us instead or have at least a harder time figuring out how to handle things when it's not so easy just to call you anymore for example so it's it's burdens also for other people if, if I as an individual decide just to opt out or disconnect yeah. most of us can't do that <laughs> um, a final thought uh, uh, that I would like to put to you before we have to wrap. I mean, we could go on forever, but but um, and and I appreciate you taking all this time. But but uh, a final thought. I mean, um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I was talking with a, a Dutch colleague, and um, she suggested uh, that oh, we we kind of agreed upon in the end that. You know, people's relationship with media has always been very intimate, very personal, um, um, and 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 yes, on the influence of new technologies, that relationship has become harder and harder to see, perhaps, if you will. Uh, however, that what has changed under the con in the context of the current coronavirus pandemic is that people have become more aware of this all of a sudden. Like when you're when you're um, almost like. Uh, um, um, forced to live in media then all of a sudden you realize this i mean i don't know about sweden but in the netherlands every single trampoline bicycle and outdoor swimming pool was sold out in the summer i mean like the people would be queuing up for hours and hours with cars to go into forests and to the beach and and like everybody was just desperate to go outside and, uh, and for us, it was partly in response to realizing, oh my God, the media is now all that I have and that's not good enough. So in that sense, could we in conclusion argue that perhaps this coronavirus crisis in that sense maybe helps us also as media scholars and as teachers to, to, to talk critically about media without immediately concluding that people should switch them off? And what do you think? Yeah, I think the, the pandemic will be a very valuable point of reference when doing interviews and we can talk about mm. the difference between using media in an everyday life context, normal <laughs> stage of life, or so to speak, uh, uh, contra using it during the pandemic and the crisis that will pro probably help us get hold of some of the things that otherwise disappear as we talked about. And mm. Um, actually, I could also just add that we began talking about this uh, article of ours on the 16 desires, 
and that's part of this project that Stina talked about that is longitudinal and and uh, we also recently got more funding for following up uh, this longitudinal study so right. we'll continue uh, doing a survey in uh, 2000 or next year and also in 2023 and 2025 so that will actually give us some ability to see whether or not certain changes perhaps stay um, or otherwise how our relationship to the media change with the pandemic so we will have a before and after the pandemic which is valuable plus that we also in this <laughs> i should also say in the disconnection uh, project we have a corona study also a qualitative survey which has been distributed uh, and answered by 550 respondents approximately wow. so we yeah. do get some insights also into how people spend times with screen and uh, also some some insights into digital resignation where if we use that term broadly where people just resign before mediatization and right any disconnection sentiments just disappear because people realize that well the media are our only contact with uh, grandparents or children's friends and School and so on and, yeah. also an interesting material to work with yeah Yes, and I can, I can add that I, I, I think you're right. I think that the pandemic is actually a good way to, to start to discuss uh, the media and the role of the media. And I think it is basically what you mentioned as one sort of uh, methodological way forward in, in order to discuss the media. And you talked about when the media break, breaks down, you can so you see them. And what has actually happened now is not that the media broke down, but that everything else broke down. <laughs> it's basically sort of gives us an opportunity to, to suddenly see things in a different light. So I think that is one of the reasons why we can actually, otherwise people start to problematize the media and the way they use them and what they mean, etc. So, uh, yeah. Great. That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, everything, everything else, else breaks down. down. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Lovely. Well, um, in that uh, joyful context, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I would like to, um, yeah, to, to end our conversation for now and, and thank you both very much again for, for doing this and for taking the time and for your work. And I'm so happy that there's more work coming from the whole team, uh, of course, not just the two of you. And, 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 and yeah, st stay well. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you so nice.